Okay, here's a brief introduction into the whole concept of equilibrium. Now in class, we're going to talk about what an equilibrium actually is, but we have seen this a couple times, and uh, we want to look at this again today. We're going to go on to uh, the idea about the forward, re forward rate of reactions equals the reverse rate of a reaction. And then we're going to go on to look at this, something called the mass action expression, which turns into this little guy here called the equilibrium constant. Now we're going to see that there are a couple of different versions of equilibrium constants. We want to mention that. And then the idea of what happens if we change the equation, what does that do to this value? So that's the stuff we want to get done in this little tutorial. We have seen uh, equilibria before. So one idea we did with a liquid vapor equilibrium. And in that idea, we were saying something like, you know, if you had a liquid and you allowed it to uh, sit, it would evaporate. So we'd have liquid changing into a vapor. But at the same time, some of those vapor particles are going to go back into the liquid. So we get a double arrow. And the idea, if we let it sit long enough, then the rate at which the liquid changes into a vapor is going to be the same as the rate at which the vapor comes back to a, a liquid, and that's going to be an equilibrium. So we get a constant amount of vapor up here, um, and in this closed container, notice it's closed, because that's important for an equilibrium to form, we would get a constant amount of uh, liquid staying in the container. So the pressure would be constant, the amount of liquid would be constant, and we would say that we have constant macroscopic properties. So this was a liquid vapor equilibrium, and we needed that when we were measuring things like vapor pressure. So when we looked at vapor pressure, we were actually calling that the um, equilibrium vapor pressure of water. Now the other place we've seen this is way back when we were looking at acids and bases, and we said things like weak acids, what was our, our um, model by which you know a weak acid would be weak because we know what happens in a weak acid is we have something like acetic acid and we know an acid increases the H plus ion concentration and so we also have acetate ions but our model was the idea that even though these guys do break up into ions there is also a really strong tendency for those ions to turn back into the uh, undissociated molecule. So it would dissociate, undissociate, dissociate, and undissociate. So again, we have an equilibrium, and that's our weak acid equilibrium in this case, to explain why there are only some of these uh, H-plus ions in solution. Uh, counter to that, we had examples like hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and we just use a single arrow because essentially all of the acid breaks up into ions. So we got a large uh, concentration of H plus ions, so that makes this one dangerous. You could put uh, vinegar on your salads, you would not put uh, a hydrochloric acid on your salad. Now, with this idea that uh, an equilibrium is a reaction which have a forward and reverse reaction going on, the idea here is um, maybe that these A's turn into B's, and I just arbitrarily picked A turns into 2B, and these B's could actually bump into each other and turn back into A's. So that's why we have a double arrow. There's a reaction that goes forward, and there's a competing reaction that goes backwards, and as the substances sit in the container, we're going to end up with certain amounts of A and B in the container. Um, and the amount of those you know, would be constant over time after it reaches equilibrium. Well, tying this back into things we've seen before, we could say the rate for the forward reaction is simply rate, and I'm going to call it rate sub f for forward rate, will be that constant k sub f times a, because it's just one a here, so the concentration of a. Now, if we look at this reaction in the reverse direction, you would say, well, the direction, the rate in the reverse direction is constant r, you know, so r for rate, uh, constant for reverse, sorry, and uh, b, since, since it's 2b, it would be b squared. So we could have a forward rate, and we could have a reverse rate, and we're saying those two are equal to each other. So my next little line, I've written those two to make them equal. Now, if they are equal, then the constant f times a and constant r times b squared uh, will also be equal. 
Now we're going to take that and just do a little manipulation and say let's put the constants together. So kf over kr, so if essentially we're dividing both sides by kr. And then we want to get the concentrations together, so let's divide both sides by a, concentration of a. So those cancel, those cancel. So what we have is a constant forward divided by constant reverse is equal to the concentration of B squared over the concentration of A. And that idea, that's called the mass action expression. And I have no idea where that, that name came from. So the mass action expression and the... Now, if you take these concentrations as we've done and say uh, this is the concentration of the products okay raised to the power of their coefficient uh, divided by the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of its coefficient although that's one that turns out to be a really useful constant so much so that we give it a name and we call that the equilibrium constant KEQ now let's look at this in a little bit more generic sense so if I had any reaction at all the easiest thing in the world is to write the KEQ because all we do is take the products so concentration of C, concentration of D raised to the power of their coefficients divided by the concentration of A and B raised to the power of those co uh, coefficients so any reaction we see we can do products over reactants now notice that it is products over reactants and that comes back here from this page let me clean this up because this is a big mess okay when we went and did uh, forward rate equals reverse rate and solved then we ended up with this idea that the forward constant rate constant divided by the reverse rate constant came out to be the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants so remember it's always products over reactants for this and we're going to call that KEQ now that value of KEQ is pretty important because it tells us if we have a large value like larger than one much larger than one then that means we have lots of products we say that reaction is very product favored if we get a value for KEQ that's very small then we say that this is reactant favored because we have large number of reactants so just the size of that KEQ gives us a clue as to where this reaction is going to end up when it reaches equilibrium Another very important point, and the reason I have this picture of a beaker right here, and that is, if we were to sit and figure out the concentration, let's say, of water, okay, and I would say, okay, well, what's the, what's the molarity of water? How many moles of water are there in one liter of water? Well, we could do that because we know a liter of water is a thousand milliliters, which is a thousand grams, and if we uh, divide by the molar mass of water, 18 grams per mole, we end up with a number something like 55.5 molar. Now that number is not important at all because just the idea is if I figured out the concentration of that water it's always going to be 55.5 moles per liter and there is no way that I can get more water into that liter of water. If I wanted more water, let's say I double the number of moles of water, well that would have to take up two liters of water. So there's you know, the concentration of a liquid, pure liquid, and also the concentration of a pure solid, those cannot change. So everybody in the world agrees, well if you're going to write this uh, constant, well why bother putting in concentrations of liquids and concentrations of solids because they are always going to be uh, constant and they're not going to change. So let's just include them as part of the KEQ constant. So when we say we're going to do a constant, okay, the constant here is concentration of products over reactants, but let's say that C was a solid or a liquid, we would not include it. So we would just put in D over A and B. So, so uh, concentrations of products over reactants raised to the power of their coefficients eliminate any solids or liquids. Now, another part of this is the idea that we can do these in concentrations and if we do we're going to call that KC so KEQ is the equilibrium constant but a special case of KEQ 
is k sub c, which is the equilibrium constant done with concentrations. And we do that all the time. So you probably see kc. If they say just k and they don't say what it is, they mean kc, concentrations. Now the other thing you could do is something called kp, which is the equilibrium constant done with pressures. So if this were a... Um, equation that had some gases in it, so say that this D was a gas and B was a gas and A was a gas, then we could set up the same expression and what we would say is the partial pressure of D raised to the D power divided by the partial pressure of A raised to the A power and the partial pressure of B raised to the B power. So that would be just as useful. So we could do things that are KPs. Okay, we can do things that are KCs. And both of those officially are KEQs. Now these will not have exactly the same value unless we have equal uh, numbers of moles. And so we have to look at later how do you change a KP into a KC, but that's another tutorial. Now a couple things we want to look at here, some manipulations. If we were to take a reaction, so here's our original reaction, and we could write a K for that. So these are gases, it turns out, but we're going to call these KCs. So I would say this is the concentration of HI squared over the concentration of H2 and the concentration of I2. I did that wrong. I could get a value for that. Now, look at this one. If I were to take this one, and you can see what I've done, is just take an exact same reaction, only turned it around so the reactants are products and the products are reactants. Well, if I wrote the Kc for this one, it would be the concentration of H2 times the concentration of I2 over the concentration of Hi squared. Now, this, I'll call this K prime. So my first Kc and my Kc prime, if you look at those, how do they compare? And it's obvious, it's just they're turned upside down because now my products are my reactants and my reactants are my products. So the idea is if I reverse the reaction, if I reverse the reaction, then all I have to do is my new K is equal to one over my old K. And that works for Kcs or Kps. So if you reverse the reaction, you just invert the K, numerically or however you want to do it. So that's manipulation number one. We're going to have three of them. Manipulation number two. In this case, you can see what happened is we start off with our uh, original equation and then we doubled it. Now this is not something we'd probably do normally, but you know it works for this uh, uh, little tutorial. So again, our first K, our original K, is going to be concentration of HI products squared over reactants. Now, if my new one, what I would have to do is my new K, I'll call it K prime again, is equal to the concentration of my HI, but instead of squared, this is going to be to the fourth power, and my H2 will be squared and my I2 will be squared. So my new expression here, so what I've done is I've doubled my equation and when I doubled it what happened is now instead of this uh, top number here being 2 it's 4 instead of these bottom numbers being 1 now they're 2 so I have squared this entire expression so my new K is equal to my old K squared. So if I double my expression, my new k, all I have to do is to get, take the old k and square it, and I get my new k. Now you can see what that also would do is that what if I went the other direction? So a more common thing might be for this reaction would be to say, uh, what if I had one half H2 plus one half I2, okay, turns into HI, so I'm doing this with fractions, so now I've halved it, so if I've halved it, then you can see that my new k is going to be the square root of k, or k to the one-half power. So if I either double or half my uh, equation, 
then all I have to do is either square or square root my k to get the new k. Okay, third situation. What if I have two equations that add up to give me my overall equation? And we've been doing this a while here, so we can see, okay, if I had H2S, I have a diprotic acid. We are going to be looking at this later as it will break up to give H plus and HS minus. And that, that actually, that change happens a lot more than the second change in which the HS breaks up to give H plus and S2 minus. So treating these as two separate steps is going to be a very good thing to do. But if I add these together, I can see, well, my HS minuses cancel and I end up with H2S, two H pluses, and an S2 minus. So how does the K for this second expression, okay, uh, come out, you know, compared to, let's call this K1 for the first step and K2 for the second step? Well, let's just do it. So this guy is concentration of H plus, concentration of HS minus, over concentration of H2S, for my second step, it's concentration of H plus times the concentration of S2 minus over the concentration of HS minus. Now, if I were to take these two expressions, and I'm going to rewrite them down here at the bottom, so I'm going to pause and just write these in. Now you can see that I've carefully tried to write these two expressions. I've just copied K1 and K2. Now if I see those next to each other, and I multiply them, then I can uh, go through and say, here's HS minus, that goes away. And what do I end up with is I have the concentration of H plus squared times the concentration of S2 minus all over the concentration of H2S. Now if you look carefully, you can see that that is HS, a concentration of H plus squared times the concentration of S2 minus over the concentration of H2S. So for this manipulation where two equations add up to give the overall equation, then my new K, okay, let's call that K prime, is equal to K1 times K2. And that's a useful thing. If I can add two equations to get a third equation, then all I have to do is multiply their k's in order to get the overall k. So k for the combined equation is equal to k1 times k2. And those are the three manipulations that we're going to see. That's the end of this tutorial.